here today with Dr. Harriet Fraud, who is a feminist activist, psychotherapist, and hypnotherapist. And Dr. Fraud has been a leader in the feminist movement um, ever since the second wave when she was a founding member of the Women's Liberation Movement. And her podcast, Capitalism Hits Home, covers politics, economics, and personal life. So Professor, um, Dr. Fraud, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to have a discussion on feminism and class. So um, a lot of my listeners are interested in the history of feminism, in particular the second wave and sort of what feminists today can take and learn from the second wave. And I'm hoping we can get into that. Also, maybe if there's things we might want to leave behind from the second wave, I'd love to hear maybe. your thoughts on that. Um, there are. No. Yeah, sure. So Maybe we can start with you telling us what do you think are some of the most important lessons from the second wave of feminism? Well, there are a lot of important lessons. One is that in the second wave, we were just beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in New Haven, Connecticut. I got notes from the first year, which was published in 1968. And it was by feminists from Red Stockings and in New York, the Women's Liberation Movement. And I thought, wow, we, we have to do this here. Called together some friends and it started. We started with five people within about two months. We had 100 coming to meetings. And what were the most valuable lessons that I learned and that I think we learned was that our method of consciousness raising, which was coming in and talking about what do you experience as a woman, was what gave us our platform. It wasn't some externally imposed idea of the right way. And in fact, as a founder, founding mother, I initiated the one rule we had at our meetings, which is everyone is welcome. Unless they know exactly what we should do, then they better be quiet and leave the meeting. Mm. Because we didn't want anyone coming in to prescribe what's right for us, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. We found our agenda through people talking about their lives. And that's very important as a democratic beginning of what issues are the most important to people, listening to people and finding out what's important to them. That was invaluable. Other lessons that we learned. One is we were very naive. So that when Gloria Steinem entered uh, women's Liberation, and said she could get us a slick magazine, Ms., and there would be no ads. We were overjoyed. We didn't think, huh, where does she get the money? Turned out from the CIA. She was a CIA agent, which is not on television, but anyone looking up on Gloria Steinem, CIA, can find ample evidence on the internet. And so we were terribly naive, and we were naive in another very important way, which is we felt that because we, black and white women together, were at the bottom of the economic ladder, if we stood up, everyone would come with us. That's not true. You know, you have now a range of feminists. You have feminists like um, Gloria Steinem, who wanted to whittle our movement down to be a gender only movement and therefore appealing to white women whose only problem was their gender, their color wasn't the problem. And only wealthier women, usually educated women. And uh, because we, you know, we wanted in to the political economic system, to the better jobs for which we were already qualified. And although the beginning of the women's movement in New Haven and in New York, included many articles on class, on what does it mean to be one of the people that creates wealth for other people versus one of the people who accumulates the wealth from his employees. Class consciousness. What is it like? I remember a wonderful story. I was at a big regional meeting I was representing New Haven, the meeting was in New York, and an amazing leader stood up because Gloria Steinem had been saying, we are women together, we share this all together. And the head of the welfare mom said, we're not together at all. We're the kind of people that work for you. 
Mm. And uh, we get lower salaries because we're black. And because we're on welfare, we're considered less. So we're not all in this together. Part, you know, we're in some things together, honey, but not all. And I think what we did that was wrong and where Gloria Steinem and the CIA and FBI really succeeded in pushing our movement down was we forgot the class element that in order for all women to be free, you can't have some people at the top with billions and other people with nothing. You can't have a system where women are expected to be equal, but there's no freed, free quality childcare like there is in most other developed countries. For example, public education and quality education is available to French parents when their child turns three and low cost childcare is available by the time their kid is zero. You know, that Cheryl, people like Sheryl Sandberg who are, you know, corporate feminists or like Hillary Clinton say you can make it if you really try. Sheryl Sandberg is a very good writer and she wrote a good book called Lean In for Corporate Women in which she says, if you have a good husband, you can have it all, you can have a great job, and also bring up two wonderful children. She didn't mention that she had nine servants, which of course does help, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that she was not, when she said lean in, she was talking to corporate leader women who can manage it because they have servants to take over women's drudgery work. The domestic labor, the childcare, the emotional caring, that comes from them, the social connecting, the responsibility for kids' lives. So if you want your kid to have a birthday party, for most people, you don't call the party planner, right? Or if you want your child to do well in school, you don't make sure that you spend time with your child, even if you're working and you can't, to help that child in reading. No, you hire a nanny who does it. And there's a very different feminism for the people who hire nannies and hire house cleaners and get takeout food and go out to restaurants or the people who are, quote, essential, although not paid that they're essential, working in grocery stores, being home health aides at minimum wage, being daycare workers, who are paid less than parking attendants are paid for watching your car, that there is a class divide. And the biggest mistake of the women's liberation movement was to be subverted by the CIA into focusing on gender only and not on the combinations of race, class, and gender in shaping people's lives. So that was a huge mistake. But the thing we did right was listening to each other. That was very important. Do you think that, I mean, I'm curious to, to hear you talk about what you think the legacy of that, um, that CIA sort of sabotage attempt has been now for feminism. I mean, do you see that, that there are conversations happening that, that um, in the broader feminist movement that you think give you hope where they're looking at class and race and these, these divisions that do separate women and, and, you know, or do you think that in a way that sort of like Hillary Clinton feminism has taken, um, you know, eminence over, over more class-based discussions? Well, I think it is more publicized. Mm -hmm. And I think that if for a feminist movement to really be a full feminist movement, you'd have to be part of a socialist movement. And what I see is that class consciousness could be the handle of the umbrella. It could be the, the staff and the handle of the umbrella and the spokes each recognized to hold up that umbrella would be things like gender issues, race issues, transgender and sexual issues, climate change and so on, that you'd have to have a united force because we're not gonna win alone. 
And what happened to the women's movement under our subversion by Gloria Steinem and corporate feminism is we became a consciousness raising movement to some extent, raising consciousness, criticizing sexism, but also not addressing the pain of working class women and excising class from the discourse so that most of our efforts went into the rape, things like the Rape Crisis Center, for which we need the support of the city and the city government. And so we need to cooperate and women's clinics where you need to cooperate with the medical establishment and raise funds and so on. And we didn't keep going as a movement for class transformation. Now, the same thing happened to the Black Liberation Movement. Mm -hmm. Instead of being Black liberation, started out as civil rights for everyone and turned into, under the guidance of the CIA and FBI, Black power, hate whitey, hate men. And, you know, I withdrew to some extent from the women's movement and um, was in, started a movement called Save Our Schools to get decent public education for our kids and also citizens concerned about childbirth. So we would have midwifery rights at the hospital. And when I went in very pregnant to talk to the Women's Liberation Group, because I wanted them to support the right for midwifery at the hospital instead of having a bunch of male obstetrics uh, students watch you and look up your vagina while you're giving birth and not have any personal relationship with you or help you. They weren't basically interested. And there was a big poster on the wall, which was cute, but really politically not what we should be believing in. And it was a picture of the man who went to the moon in outer space. And it said they took one man to the moon. Now they can take the rest of it, which is cute on the one hand, but we're never going to win anything or everything unless we're united with all the people who believe that everyone has a right to exist, black, white, male, female, and has a right to all the riches of the society, which is a class-based movement. To some extent, it was a problem in the whole movement. Class is still the most repressed discourse in the United States. It disappeared from our lexicon until the Occupy movement, where the 1%, 99% illustrated that our fates are very different. And I should point out that the corporate moderate Obama crushed every Occupy on the same day across this country yeah. because it was a class challenge. And so that I think women won't be fully liberated until we have we address the issues of class and have public childcare that is quality childcare. We are the only nation that's a developed country that doesn't have that, where we have after school programs and summer programs for children, where maternity leave and paternity leave, which are available in all the Scandinavian and all the European countries that are developed and are not here. We are one of five countries that doesn't have paid maternity leave. And that's Swaz United States, Swaziland, Somalia, pa um, Papua New Guinea. And um, what is the last one? It's the same level of development as the other four. Okay. Oh. And so that, and we also have to have what they have in Norway, which is compulsory paternity leave. So men can't get any extra credit for not bonding with their babies while right. they get paid. Right. And those are things that are government benefits. Mm -hmm. And yet starting in 1980, our movement really got started in about 1968. By 1980, Ra Ronald Reagan was successful in convincing people that the enemy was big government rather than big corporations. Mm -hmm. The New Deal was brought to us by big government all those benefits, social security, unemployment, um, insurance, mm. civilian conservation corps, 
the Workers' Progress Administration, all of those things. That was big government, which was the most popular government America ever had. And so that we, we'd have to bring class considerations back to have a kind of vital movement that isn't race divided because poor people, well, poor people, the majority of the poor in the United States are white, but the majority of black people are poor and we're not going to attract an interracial movement unless we, we address class and race issues. Mm. And we didn't. And that was a huge mistake. Okay. Yeah, really um, a very timely one as well. And before we get more into the, because um, I, want, I want to ask you more about the, the advance of the corporate world and what that's done to these social movements. But, I, but first, I just, I have to ask because you mentioned transgender rights and I'm not sure how um, tuned in you are to these debates that are raging around transgender rights right now between you know some feminists and the transgender movement and you've got like yeah. s- sites of contestation being sports prisons rape relief shelters uh, do you want to give us your thoughts on that well there is an issue if someone has a male formed body one is more powerful there has to be some kind of room for that within women's sports because otherwise you create hatred between the transgender athletes and the fully female athletes. That has to be recognized. I think that everyone has a right to live, but everybody's differences have to be recognized. And I also think that the left should embrace everyone, everyone who is on our side, everyone who wants to redistribute the wealth and give every human being a chance without any arbitrary divisions between male and female, people of different colors, people who with different gender preferences. And that the point is to unite, not to monitor each other on political correctness, which was introduced about the same time as Gloria Steinem and the black movement were subverted to get the left busy policing each other on being politically correct instead of uniting, because it's the only way we'll win. We are the majority. We need each other. And if we're busy policing each other's microaggressions, we are not going to win. Mm -hmm. And the point is to win, not to be moral and correct, but to win and to give everyone a chance. And I can see in a meeting if somebody's discriminatory, they should be stopped. If somebody uses only he, she, and not they or there, okay. You can say, wait a minute, correction, but not, oh, you are the monster that disturbs the revolution. No, you know, there, we have, the most important thing is connecting. We don't have a chance without it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you think that, um, you know, that whole politically correct cancel culture censorious thing, where do you see that either coming from or who does that serve? I mean, this is something that I discuss a lot on my show because my story was that I was canceled for critiquing aspects of those like pronouns and things like that. Um, So it's a very, you know, interesting issue to me. But I do wonder if, you know, do, do you think that that comes from a similar place of sort of corporate disruption or? Yes, I do. I think it comes from corporate disruption. I think there has to be a place for everyone within our movement. But I think it, it was introduced along with the subversion of our movements. Hmm. Because if we're busy being politically correct, we're not going to be busy uniting with each other. Yeah. You know, there's... Even the very left, very feminist, probably best comedian in the United States, Amy Sedaris, makes fun of that. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to assume that people who, who believe in social justice are allies. And so they're not to be dismissed totally for a mistake. They're to be corrected. We need each other. That's the most basic and important thing. And I think where we went wrong as the feminist movement was we, instead of saying, 
We're not ready to deal with men. We've been programmed to be unequal. So we want separate meetings, but not that men are incorrigible. So we need separate meetings. That's a very different message. Mm -hmm. We were sexist too. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were ridiculously deferential and still are deferential to men because it's been programmed in us. We're supposed to please. You watch women going out on dates. I live in New York City. I see a lot of people. The men look like real schlumps. The women are all dolled up wearing uncomfortable shoes and makeup and everything else where the guy's in a a T-shirt and sneakers. That we are taught that we have to please. And I think it's we all should be pleasing as much as we can. Not sex objects, but pleasing. And that... You know, we're part of the beauty of the world when we go out of our house and men are too and they ought to remember it. But that that's for everyone. And so that I think since we were programmed into deference, it was important to have meetings by ourselves. Otherwise we would defer to the men in the room who would be assertive and overwhelm us. But that doesn't mean it's because they're inferior and incorrigible. It means that we weren't ready for that. And both of us have to be careful to make a unified movement. So that was a big mistake. That's interesting. And I wonder if, you know, we are ready for that now, if feminists are, have advanced. I hope you know? so. And if we haven't, women should meet separately, but not because men are incorrigible, hmm. but because we all have a gender training that women really have to get over. You know, I've been a feminist for like 600 years. If, you know, I'm old. But I have to watch out for the deference that I have to the husband that I love and believes in equality. Just we're trained that way. You know, we're supposed to look good. We're supposed to be careful. We're supposed to be pleasing. And I think everyone should be pleasing and careful. One of the reasons the majority of managers are now female is because we know how to negotiate. We know how to consider. We know how to compromise. It's not a testosterone infused uh, aggression job management if it's successful. And so that I think we can both learn from the pleasing qualities that women were taught but we were taught to please men. We were taught to defer to men. Mm. Most of us have seen our mothers being deferential. And men have seen women being deferential. So we all need to be sensitive about it. And I think women still need to sometimes meet separately in order to recognize that we defer Mm. in ways that are unhealthy for us and men. Yeah, to even become aware of that. Um, Now, I want to get back a bit to the discussion that I'm very interested in your thoughts on the the corporate takeover and and everything that's this sort of like insidious corporate entry into feminism. And you did a series recently on your channel that was about the state of men in America right now. That's a really good series. I recommend people check it out. I'll link it below so that people can find it. Um, And you talk about how, you know, it used to be of course, that men were expected to support the whole family and provide with it with his income. But now it's the case that only 5% of men earn enough of a salary to actually support a whole family. So it's completely changed the home dynamics and the work dynamics. So maybe we could start first with the um, sort of the bigger picture of how did that happen from the corporate end, from the from the, the capitalist end in terms of like, they got to double their workforce. Was that a completely cynical use of the feminist ideology? Like, okay, women can come to work now because, you know, ha ha ha, we're greedy. We get double the workforce. Yeah. Well, I think that part of their encouragement was that they wanted women to come in as cheap labor because mm-hmm. we were paid less. And that I think really what happened in America, and it has skewed gender relationships. And I ought to say before I forget, I have two podcasts. Another one is called, It's Not Just In Your Head. And it's mainly around 
It's with Max Golding. And it's mainly around showing people that the things from which they suffer personally, because we're both in the therapy community, are not just in your head. If you're getting evicted, your problem isn't psychological. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are many other influences. But I think... Now we should get back to your question. Would you say it again so I can sure. sort of focus? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so my question is about how the um, the capitalist elite class used might have used feminist ideology for their own ends to you know reduce scarcity, it reduced scarcity of the the work population, the labor population. So now did they kind of push feminism in order to just do that cynically so that they could make more profit? I think that they pushed feminism because they wanted more. Look, what happened basically in America is that starting in the mid to late 70s, multinational corp corporations realized they had sophisticated international communication systems, faxes, computers. They also had jet travel that was far more sophisticated. And they thought, why should we pay these workers $30 an hour, these skill, these male unionized workers, when we could get an Asian to work for $4 an hour or two? What are we doing? Also, they have no ecological protections, no pensions, this is going to be a bonanza. And so what they, they basically did was they exported millions of jobs that were held by better paid white men overseas where they could get cheap labor. At the same time, women were wanting into the labor force, which they wanted because they wanted to cheap in labor. And blacks were looking for civil rights and entrance into the labor force, which was fine with them. And they could also take those white men who were dispossessed and blame it on uppity women and dark people and immigrants coming in to take their job. When actually what happened was their jobs were exported. And we didn't have the strong socialist and communist unions that places like Germany had, the best economy in Europe, where outsourcing is outlawed. That's why the German metal workers got a 22 hour work week at the same good pay and all their benefits because they can't outsource their jobs. In Sweden, anyone who wants to outsource jobs and close their factory has to find every single person in the, on the job an equivalently paying job. No mean trick. It's easier to produce something else than it is to outsource. So that we didn't have those kind of strong unions. Class consciousness and the socialist movement and the communist movement were crushed in the McCarthy era. And so that our labor movement was gutted. And we didn't have the kind of power that would have stopped outsourcing. And so millions of white male workers lost the family wage and their wives had to join the labor force as their black sisters had to always. And what happened was the family system that was based on the wage earning male and the dependent wife and children fell apart in the white community the way it did in the black community for the same reasons. Because if part of being a man is being able to support your family, that's over, honey. That's just over. And now billions are being made. Salaries are depressed. Unions have, are just beginning to come back. And the corporate class between their overseas billions and their lower salaries in the United States can buy our for sale political system. We're about the only developed country that allows private money in elections and private money to campaign before. In France, which I know more about, so I'll cite France, but it's true of all of them, you have, I think it's two months in which you can run 
There's no private advertising for candidates. Private money for candidates is forbidden. One of the reasons that Sarkozy is now facing jail time is he took private money. And every candidate has a chance to present on television the same amount of time. So if you watch that on French TV, which I've been in France while it was on, you watch like eight candidates stand up and say what they stand for. The fascist party, the communist party, the socialist party, the revolutionary so socialist party, the anarchist party, and so on. And they have, you know, on the average, 89% of their population voting because there's actually a choice. Right. It's not just two capitalist parties. So they have a choice. But what happened was, those rich corporate entities bought our political system, weakened union regulations, and took over. And the American public are immiserated. And what happened, particularly to men, is they lost their position. The majority of women are now single. And they're single by choice. And it's not only because men die first, it's because... 40% of women have a kid outside of marriage because what's the point of being married, having to work full time, take care of a kid or not, then come home and do what, the, what Arlie Hochschild calls the second shift of the cooking, the cleaning, the housework, the emotional care of the husband, the social connection of the kids and the husband to the outside world and their relatives and everything else. So men are in terrible trouble. Women who've gotten more powerful have not had our emotional lives destroyed when we leave men. Women's primary relationships weren't dependent on a sexual relationship necessarily. A lot of men felt it was sissy to talk about their feelings with anyone else besides their sex partner. So when that's over, they have no one to talk to. Women often look to their friends to their relatives and to their children for emotional connection. And so we still have all of that. We're still connected. And because of the women's movement, we're in jobs we weren't in before. And there's a kind of entitlement, which the women's movement initiated, and it's very important, an entitlement to be treated well and to be paid well. Whereas men have had a decrease in the tokens of manhood, which are making a good wage, and having a woman as a companion. For a couple of months, I studied the mass murderers. Mm. They all had something in common. They had either or both the end of a relationship or the end of employment, the two tokens of manhood. And if you looked at the January 6th invasion, they were almost all men. And in fact, a client of mine did a very clever feminist thing after that invasion. She put an ad on Christian Mingle that said, um, and she's a very good looking curvy blonde. She said, I'm looking for a man, a real man, the kind of man who isn't afraid to break rules no matter who has them, send a photo. And then she matched 22 of the photos she got with the pictures from the um, invasion on January 6th and sent them to the FBI showing the over, you know, because Christianity is, is an area where men have found refuge from their demoted position economically because the Southern Baptist Convention on Men and Women dictates that women must be subordinate to men. Men should be protective and women are subordinate. You're not supposed to be a manager of men if you're a woman. And that's the biggest Protestant denomination. The Catholics have a similar thing in very religious Catholics. And so religion has been one of the hideouts for men. So has the NRA. So has the army. And um, those are three of the hideouts. And the, the evangelical religions and the Southern Baptist religions, the army, and the NRA and these militias of men 
You know, there's the proud boys. It's not the proud boys and girls. The boogaloo boys, not the boogaloo, boogaloo girls and boys association. They're male bonding in violence and guns. Mm. And that's, you know, over 4th of July weekend, 230 murders took place and they were all committed by men. 618 people were shot by men because one way of recapturing your manhood is at the, you know, like Dirty Harry, make my day as you're about to shoot somebody in the head, you know, is an extension of power and masculinity. Women don't look to guns to extend our femininity. Yeah. Yeah. So my next question is, um, you know, it's undeniable that, as you've said, women have gained more status and more freedom and in many ways liberation. Well, certainly liberation from the necessity of being a housewife in for white women, as you specified, um, and of a certain class. But is there a sense that we may have now that, I mean, now we need to be liberated from the workplace because what women and men, because we're being exploited there and we don't really get to have careers that feel good, that we get to take time off. Like you said, we don't have those labor laws here. Um, we're, we've kind of become chained to the work. I mean, do you, do you think that's accurate? We've, we've now become chained to the workplace in a detrimental way. Yes, I think so. And I think black women never had the luxury of being housewives because their husbands and men didn't earn a family wage. And so they were always more resilient and more independent because they had to be. Black women have always had to work. And if they worked in the homes, they worked in a lot of the homes of white women, too. Yeah. As domestic workers who were spared in the workers' rights granted during the New Deal, they spared the rights of farm workers to get the South into it, and they spared the lot the domestic workers to mm -hmm. get the South happy with their black domestic servants. It was a horribly discriminatory and racist decision. But I think that we now need to unite around class, that as the working class, as the people who make the wealth of the world, we need a say in how it's produced. We should have co-ops instead of top-down corporate structures where the CEO gets an obscene salary no matter how he messes up, and where the point is to give to the shareholders rather than share among the workers who created the product or the service. That's a much more democratic way of doing it through co-ops. Or we need to do what Germany has done, and Germany is such a rich country and the most successful in Europe and what the Scandinavians do as well is on every board of directors, there have to be the ecological representatives in the neighborhood to see what that business is doing to the neighborhood. The union has to be represented very well. And so that the, any move has to be considered what it does to the neighborhood, what it does to the workers. And we don't have that because we haven't, because our workers movement was crushed in the anti-communist accusations of McCarthy in the 1950s. First, he went after the communists and said they were traitors, which is interesting. They're not mentioning that they're traitors having invaded the White House. And here you were a traitor just being in the Communist Party. The socialists were fellow travelers, so they were suspect and want to be fired and jailed and all the other things they did to them. And the unions were highly suspect. And if you look at what created the power of workers, there were three things. There was the CIO, a union of millions. There was the Communist Party and the Socialist Party who were very active in organizing labor and in radicalizing people. And they went after, went after them one by one, communists, socialists, labor, until they were both gutted. And we need organizations that are class-based organizations with room for gender and race and sexual and climate change united because we're the majority. Yeah. If we unite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, some of the ways that, that, that these changes have, 
have uh, manifested themselves in male culture. Like some of you mentioned some of the more extreme ways, like the shooters, but I'm curious, what do you think just on the more mundane quotidian level, how have things changed between men and women now that the family salary is a thing of the past and women have stepped up to take their place in the, or, you know, all, uh, all women generally have stepped up to take their place in the workforce. How has that changed the just day-to-day relations between men and women? Well, the way it's changed the day-to-day relations is, first of all, that people are not necessarily in marriages and that those people who do marry, the biggest trend is not to have children because it's too expensive. Unless you have some, the only people having a lot of children now are the top 5% who have nannies and maids and take out food and restaurants and all the rest of it, so that the woman is kind of the manager. It's a very good book on this called Park Avenue Primates or Primates of Park Avenue. And it's, um, you know, it talks about that phenomenon at the top, having lots of children and the woman being kind of a manager of the staff, taking care of the house and children because she's no longer one of the serfs working in exchange for love and protection, she's the feudal manager of that household. Mm -hmm. And we're only talking about um, 5% of the population at most. Yeah. But I think it's changed in that women are expecting better treatment. Men are wanting women to compensate them for their status lowering and the conflicts are greater. Women want more sexual equality, and that's difficult for some men. And so the households have evolved into new forms. The biggest form is the independent household where women are living alone or with children because the majority are not married, or people living together. They don't have a measure for how many people just live together and then split if it doesn't work out without getting the state involved. Or communal households where the demands are made and people try to share both domestic work and emotional work and work outside the home, which is hard because men are paid more, so they tend to um, be honored by doing less domestic labor and... um, if somebody has to quit their job or go part-time since men are paid more, it's usually the woman who goes to part-time. And then if there's a divorce is really screwed. Mm. But um, but there are huge changes in home life. Only, you know, in 1965, the overwhelming majority of people were married and with children Now it's a much smaller fraction of the population who is married. Most women are unmarried. Most children don't grow up with their biological parents. In fact, 75% of them don't grow up with the two parents who were part of their creation. Either 40% of kids are born outside of a marriage and people get divorced and then recouple and enter marriages or not marriages, but living together. So the whole landscape of personal life has changed. And just as wage stability and a job you can count on was something that people could count on, could feel like, oh yes, I will have a good job if I'm white and male. Yes, you can't count on that anymore. Everything's precarious for both men and women. Their relationships are precarious. Their jobs are precarious, and that's a big emotional change that goes with the economic change. Mm. It's unsettling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you would say to those of us who, and I include myself in this, kind of do feel sort of desire to pull back a bit from the, from feminism or from, you know, these social justice movements, because we feel that corporate takeover and we feel that lack of class analysis and even, you know, worse than just a lack, but really a repression of any class analysis, like a rejection of it. 
And I mean, what would you say to, to us should, what, what can we do, you know, on a practical level to try to bring those things back? Like what are there campaigns that you think we should, you know, that you support like specific campaigns or specific areas of activism or, you know, legislation changes or anything like that, that you would point to, to like invest in right now? Well, I think it's important for groups of women to join all the organizations, but especially socialist organizations and push class analysis. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important and insist on class analysis and inclusion and fight against those elements that want to exclude people Mm -hmm. because there are millions of people. In fact, the majority of people under 30 now prefer socialism to capitalism. Yeah. And the point is that it's not all about making money. You want a life to be fuller Mm -hmm. and you want a socialist presence and you support socialist candidates and socialist projects. And there are social, the sunrise movement within climate change is very much an anti-capitalist movement. The poor people's campaign with Reverend Barber is very much an anti-capitalist movement. DSA has a very strong anti-capitalist presence. The movement for co-ops instead of capitalist enterprises is getting stronger. And I think women should join these groups as a group so you support each other because everyone needs support. So you support each other within the organization and don't tolerate that crap. Denounce it as divisive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And have the courage to say that's dividing us. That's a big mistake. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's initiated by the CIA. There's a very good book called The Great Wurlitzer because that's what the move by the CIA was called because the Wurlitzer is an organ where you can make it sound different if you pull out different stops. It was a good image. And they can look up the role of the CIA and Gloria Steinem and others in disrupting the um, civil rights movement and the um, women's liberation movement, but that insist on class analysis as part of it. Mm rather than get caught up in these other tendencies, because that is so poison. Right, right. Um, One of the things that you mentioned on your podcast was um, that the basis of all mental health is human connection. And I really like that because I think so often we hear things that are talking about how mental health is based in other things, like going to therapy, which there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but going to therapy or doing or buying things, you know, consuming or things like that. But your message was so simple that all of mental health is really just based on the connections we have with other people that you can't buy and um, you can't pay for them. Um, And do you see any element of people looking for that in activism? And maybe is that a detriment or is that a a benefit? Is that something good where people can find connection or is that hurting the I think it can be, Mm. you know, I think it really can be because look, you're never going to win unless you connect with other people. Mm. And that's something that if people meet and connect personally or as partners through a movement, that's fine. They already have something big in common, Mm. but we need all kinds of connection. And, you know, it's, it's sad. Um, Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone in 2009. He wrote it. And he said one in four Americans has no one to talk to and that there are fewer people engaged in anything than were in bowling leagues alone in 1970. And that includes PTAs, blood drives, political campaigns, soccer teams, you know, whatever, darts teams. And that study that he did has been repeated and repeated. There's a guy named Robert Altemeyer, who's a Canadian who keeps repeating those and finding the same thing. That, and Johan Hari has a very good book called Lost Connections. What I feel like is mental health is a table with four legs and they all have to do with connection. 
And, you know, of course, mothers are children's first connection as they look for food that starts their intellectual curiosity as they're rooting around for milk, feeling things, tasting things, getting to know things. But our, the first way you have to be connected is with somebody really close that you can talk to in a hard time. And it could be a sex partner. It could be a deep friendship. It could be a relative that you really feel close to. It could be a parent that you feel that close to. You could tell them anything. So an intimate connection. The next level is a set of people that you feel you are connected to. Friends, teammates, you know, that you maybe see only once or twice a year, but you really have a connection with who you can call, you can talk to, but they're not a primary, but a secondary nourishing connection. A third is connection with people with whom you do something. Either you work together or you're on a team together or you do the blood drive or the PTA or they're on a political project with you or a social project with you. And so that you connect on that level, believing in something together, doing something together that you want to bond about. And one of the big attractions of these militia groups and extreme religions is people feel they belong to something. Mm. They followed those people who followed Trump from rally to rally, felt they belonged, even though they were being cynically used, they felt right. they belonged. And then, so we have three, that's three legs. And the fourth leg is feeling like you're part of the world that you are an American relating to what's happening here, that you're connected to all the people doing things. Like when I read that the Argentinian women in that strongly Catholic repressive country won abortion rights, it made my day. I'm not Argentinian, but that they managed a coalition with the indigenous movement, the left, and women, even though the Catholic Church, which is dominant there, and the right wing fought them, and they had lost the two other times they brought it up, they won. Or I could identify with the um, sex workers co-op, the biggest co-op in the world is the 20,000 strong Usha Women's Cooperative in India, where they make their own they have their own bank because the bankers who would pay for their prostitution services in the day would deny them a loan you know, on their job. They have their own bank. They have their own sanitary napkin production factory. They have their own birth control factory. They have their own clinic. And they're 20,000 women strong in their union. And I can get a thrill out of that, even though I'm not Indian. Or that... Those women, I, over a million women joining hands at a certain point to establish solidarity in India. Wow. You know, that I'm connected with the things I believe in that are bigger than me, not just in a church, but in the world. That's a very big connection. Now, as part of the connections that people need, some of them are found in a church or in a movement, but you need to be connected. And every single mass murderer that they write about say he was a loner, right? Yeah. Because human connection means that you have some compassion for other people. You see them. And if you're just mowing people down, you can't possibly be thinking of what did their lives mean? Who did they love? What about the people around them? What about the children? You can't. So that connection is hugely important, both to a movement, but also to basic mental health. Hermits aren't healthy. Yeah. And well, you know, you never find a body from the cave era. You never find one body alone. People can't survive on their own psychologically in the way they didn't used to be able to survive physically. Yeah. Well, I want to start to wrap up in a minute, but you made me think of another question I'd like to ask you, which is, 
do you think that, do you um, define women as a political class and should we feel um, a connection with all women as a group based on that identity? Well, I don't think women are a class. I okay. think class for me is who creates the wealth and who gets to take that wealth and decide what to do with it. And that's true whether you're looking at a household, who produces the use values, the cooking, the cleaning, the sexual pleasure, the children, the childcare, and who gets to appropriate and benefit from them. And in the old time, women were more like a feudal class. They were like the serfs. They create useful things, food, childcare, order, cleanliness, and the man appropriates those things. And uh, that's, and she gets the protection of that man, like the feudal serf got an amount of land and a feudal housewife gets the household paid for by the man and does services within it. And so that that would be a feudal class structure. Whereas on the opposite, you could have a capital this class structure where the boss and the CEOs and the board of directors appropriates the wealth you create, give you a little share, keep the rest as profit. That's capitalism. Or you could have a communal class process where people share it, like in a co-op where they decide who gets what, where, you know, and or in a communal household where they do that. So that's what class is to me. Women are a gender. And they're divided by class, they're divided by color. We're not all the same. We have some issues in common, like abortion rights, although rich women have always been able to afford abortions. But abortion was, went across many class lines. Abortion, right to education, admission to judgeships, which of course you have to be educated for. But I think there are some issues on which women can unite. Sexual harassment is one, since it goes up the entire ladder. Times up, takes care of like the 30,000 farm workers who, who were abused and put in suits, or all the way up to Carlson at Fox News, where they yeah. had to have glass desks to show off their legs and wear high skirts and were paid well at the top if they had sex with the boss. You know, that sexual abuse goes up the ladder. Mm -hmm. And so that those are issues all women can unite, but not because we're a class, but because we're a gender, which is stratified according to class and race. So I don't think we are a class because we're women even though there are things that unify us like sexual harassment protests. Does that make okay. sense? To you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting because I hear different arguments from different sides. You know, some say we should consider ourselves a class, some say we shouldn't. So it's very interesting. And thank you so much, Dr. Fraud. I'm going to wrap it up here. Sure. And I also forgot to mention in the beginning that this is actually my second interview with Dr. Fraud because it was almost, I think, two years ago now we got to sit down and talk. One of my first ever interviews that I've done. So thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And hopefully maybe you'll come back sometime. I will. And your questions are wonderful and thoughtful. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.